Hi, everyone, and welcome, and welcome back to many of you to JVC's weekly Authors at the Table series. I'm Naomi Firestone Teeter, JVC's Executive Director, and I'm excited to welcome you to today's discussion with Liel Leibovitz, a longtime friend of JVC who has just published a biography of Stan Lee as part of the Jewish Lives series. We're so appreciative of you joining us here each week to celebrate authors of recently released books, and I hope that you will continue to join us for this weekly series. In addition, tonight at 5.30, we're co-presenting a talk with Boris Fishman and Bonnie Morales on Soviet Jewish cuisine for the Great Big Jewish Food Fest, and I hope to see you there as well. You can find a chat to this event and more in the chat section throughout the program, and please be sure to copy the links over to your computer before the conclusion at 1 p.m. You can also save the chat links by clicking the three dots to the right of the chat box. For those of you unfamiliar, Jewish Book Council is a nonprofit organization that educates and enriches the community through Jewish literature. Visit jewishbookcouncil.org to learn about JVC's reviews, essays, and literary journal, Paper Brigade, our book club resources and author tours, and our literary awards, including the National Jewish Book Awards. I hope you will check out all of our programs and resources, and that you might also consider becoming a member to support JVC's continued, continued initiatives. Each week, a different member of JVC's team hosts our Authors at the Table conversation. And this week, I'm very pleased to introduce you to our JVC Network Director, Suzanne Swift, who will lead the discussion. Over to you, Suzanne. Thank you, Naomi, and thank you, a huge thank you to Liel for joining us today. Welcome to this JVC Author at the Table. This is our fifth installment already uh, for our lunchtime series, which we introduce our readers to authors whose books recently got released. We hope you'll continue enjoying joining us in the coming weeks and support our authors by purchasing their books. You can find the link for Liel's book in our chat. On the screen, you'll see JBC staff, and we'll all be chiming in with questions during the conversation. Anyone in the audience that would like to share their, your own question, please use the Q&A feature in the bottom of your Zoom screen. Also, at the top of your screen, you'll have the option to view the discussion in a gallery or speaker mode, so please choose whichever you prefer. With that said, I am very excited to introduce Liel Leibowitz. For many of you who know an Orthodox, he needs no introduction. In fact, he could be interviewing all of us. Um, Liel's new book, Stan Lee, A Life in Comics, is the latest addition to the Jewish Live series. Liel is an Israeli-American journalist, author, and senior writer for Tablet, and one of the hosts of Unorthodox, a popular Jewish podcast that has over a million downloads. Liel is a co-author of the New Jewish Encyclopedia, and if you haven't ordered that and looked at that, it's a lot of fun to read. Wrote Broken Hallelujah, a biography of Leonard Cohen, and so much more. I just wanted to start to tell you that my family and I are huge Marvel fans and DC fans, so this is exciting for me to be able to, to interview. Um, thank you for thank joining you. us. It's my pleasure, and I'm a huge JBC fan. You guys are like <laughs> the Avengers, only with books, which is like a million times better. <laughs> So tell us how you're all doing and how you're handling this crazy world that we're living in right now. Uh, you know, for, for bearded middle-aged nerds, uh, the differences between pre-COVID and post-COVID are very, very small. Basically, us being in our homes alone, talking to almost no one while watching copious amounts of cartoons on TV and reading books. Yep, it seems about the same. We're very fortunate, even though we're here at the heart of darkness in Manhattan. Uh, with two children, one of whom is standing right here, hovering above me. Uh, we're very fortunate to be um, to be healthy and and happy and have books, as you can see in the background. Tip out <laughs> so it's so interesting on all these, seeing the people's in their rooms and where they're they're talking to us from, and all their books that they have. Can you tell us a bit about your book and why you chose to write about Stanley? So this this uh, journey <laughs> began uh, this origin story, I should say, uh, of superheroes began when I was seven uh, and was taken to New York for the first time by my parents. And they must have looked at some guidebook, uh, things to do with annoying, hey, you can see another child, in fact, several in the background. Uh, they must have looked at some uh, guidebook of, you know, what to do with annoying seven-year-olds in New York City because their first stop in the journey was this incredible shop that incredibly still exists called Forbidden Planet. Uh, which is the world's, I think, one of the world's great comic book stores. Uh, and they took me there and I just sort of gravitated to all these incredible, colorful, beautiful books uh, and then convinced my parents to buy them all for me 
under the excuse that this would uh, help me to learn the English much better, uh, which incredibly they did. The first time I started reading Marvel Comics, I was absolutely blown away because I felt that there was something, and this happened only with Marvel, not with you know the Batman, Superman, and the other comic book universes. I felt there was something, uh, although I could not have put it in these words at the time, I felt there was something in the DNA of these comic books that was deeply Jewish, that was kind of resonant to anyone who has uh, grown up like me, you know, reading a lot of Bible and, and taking that into, uh, into account. And it just kind of really uh, stirred my soul, really. I mean, it excited me in a way that's way past the kind of, you know, silly action movie or even the sort of Star Wars universe or the other things I was into. Uh, and so began a very long, um, you know, impassionate love affair with these comic books. And so when, when uh, the Jewish Book Live series, Neil University Press said, hey, would you like to write a book about Stanley? <laughs> sort of looked at them like, huh, would I now? Yes, please. Ironically, that was my next question. How did the Jewish Live series decide to do a book about Stan Lee? And, and why did they feel it was an important part of their series to add it in? Well, um, I, I think, uh, first of all, I, I applaud them because there is still, despite the fact uh, that, you know, Marvel Comics started as a counterculture, it is now very much the culture. Uh, it is the dominant force in uh, movies, television, video games. It, it drives so much, not only of the revenue, but of the cultural reference points that we have. Uh, and despite that fact, there is still a kind of snobbery involved. Uh, it, it is difficult for one, for me, to uh, get into serious conversations with real book lovers and, and be asked, you know, what are you into? And uh, if I had to say, I would say Marcel Proust and The Silver Surfer are my kind of the <laughs> twin pillars of, you know, my emotional intellectual universe. And only one of them is taken seriously. So I was, I was immensely gratified that Yale University Press uh, expressed an interest in this and told them right away that the kind of book that I wanted to write wasn't a straightforward biography, because I frankly find biographies kind of a little bit uh, weird sometimes. The, the stories tend to repeat themselves. People's lives tend to kind of follow these patterns that you know sound made up even though they're real. What I wanted to write is really a story uh, that, that looked at the work and life of a man uh, who spent about nine decades uh, running away from the fact that he was creating a very religious mythology for modern day America and try to unpack the religious influences behind it, but specifically the Jewish influences behind it. Well, and that leads right into my very next question about the Jewish influence in this and how we create it using Jewish roots to create these fictional universes that are just incredibly dense and has a lot of um, impactfulness and it's totally based on a lot of Jewish information that we've learned growing up. I mean the incredible thing is if you ask him which people had throughout the decades uh, you know do you have any Jewish education and did you mean it he literally asked with a sort of like half smile like what do you mean <laughs> like I've what, the bible I've never heard of it never read it uh, and yet when you sort of look at the stories themselves and, and begin unpacking them, begin really thinking about them, the similarities are completely resonant. Uh, one of my favorite examples to give uh, is the case of Spider-Man. I mean, here is a story of someone who all of a sudden comes into great power uh, and does nothing to stop a murder uh, and is then basically asked by the universe, you know, uh, you know or, or asks the universe, am I my brother's keeper? Uh, and answers in the positive and then has to suffer the consequences of his misdeed by spending the entirety of his career um, roaming throughout the land and, and helping others. Uh, this, is a, this is King the writ large, right? This is, this is kind of a retelling of this biblical story. Uh, or the Silver Surfer, who is a, 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 an ordinary being uh, who is uh, one day approached by a god and asked to leave his home, which he loved, and go forth to a different land and help stand up for innocent people and protect them, which is again, kind of a retelling of, of, of the Abraham story. And the more you kind of read into these stories and, and the more you sort of juxtapose them with the classical biblical narratives that, that I know full well, having now researched Stan Lee's life, he was definitely into, um, the more you walk away with something that, that kind of 
kind of weirds you out and at the same time, I think, awes you in, in the biblical sense of the word because you realize how rich and how resonant these stories are. And you realize that they're not just our shared culture at the moment because they're fun and cool and these guys in tights are fighting monsters or aliens or whatever, but rather that Stanley's genius is finding a way to retell a very old story in a very new way that, uh, that people could reconnect to very easily, people across all religious and socioeconomic traditions. So one of the big conversations in our house when a new movie comes out is Marvel DC Comics. And we go back and forth um, <laughs> in our house. Um, and I'm sure lots of other people do. Um, they were both created by Jews and they both are trying to create, um, you know, appeal to a, a general audience beyond the Jewish world. Um, so, you know, Spider-Man and Superman, um, Hulk and um, Batman. Can you talk a little bit about these two Jews that created these two universes? Oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, so it's, it's very interesting uh, because what you said is very true, that the DC universe, which by the way, precedes the Marvel universe by, you know, 30 years, 20 years, um, was all started by Jews. Uh, the two teenagers from Cleveland who created Superman, the two teenagers from Queens and the Bronx who created Batman, all, you know, young Jews, sons uh, of, of newly or recently arrived immigrants. Uh, but here's the thing <clears throat> about this first generation comics, about these DC characters, right? These DC characters, uh, to me, and this was one of the funnest parts of the book to write, are really the embodiment of this, you know, old Protestant um, struggle between uh, fundamentalism on the one hand and modernism on the other hand. On the one hand of this, you have Superman, who is basically Jesus Christ alien, right? He's, a, he's a, an infallible character who arrives to earth to redeem us uh, by his good grace for our sins. And there's nothing particularly interesting about him because all he does is swoop into action, fly in, save the day, repeat, and, and that, is his, uh, that is his mission. Uh, on the other hand, you have Batman, who is a character with no real superhero uh, powers, but rather a testament to the fact that industriousness and capitalism and good work ethic, you know, the good old Protestant work ethic could always save the day, which has been the kind of ancient Protestant uh, tension that has always animated America for definitely its first you know, uh, century, century and a half. This is kind of what Gary Wills referred to as the head and the heart, right? These are the captains who led the, the war, you know, the, the Revolutionary War versus the believers who fought in the Revolutionary War. And into this kind of narrative that is beginning to feel a little tired by, by mid 20th century uh, comes, comes this middle-aged Jew and says, we're going to do things completely differently. We're going to give creatures uh, that you have never seen before, here's what they're going to do. They're going to argue a lot. Uh, they're going to fail a lot. They're going to uh, have personal lives and real problems. They're going to be very neurotic. Uh, and so right from the beginning, and this is why I think I connected this so deeply as a kid, like you pick up the Fantastic Four and it might be your uncles and, and aunts and cousins and, and nieces, right? Because you've heard this language, you've heard this cadence of quibbling all the time around the Seder table, like this is who we are. Uh, and so that is the first principle. The second principle, which I really love, unlike Superman and, and Batman, who are both basically infallible creatures. Like you, you, they will never take a real hit in any of the comic books. In fact, that's part of their charm. The Marvel comic uh, characters, they, they, they get battered and beaten all the time. And it's just one more, um, I think, Talmudic element. It's, it's this uh, repraisal of this famous Talmudic story of, you know, rabbis arguing here on earth, and then God finally, you know, has enough of their quibble, and he comes down from heaven and says, you know, you and you are right. And the other rabbis look at him and says, uh, excuse me, sir, but down here on earth, we get to decide who's right and who's not. That's the Marvel Universe logic. It's, it's these supremely godlike creatures who are still at the same time have no real control over the universe and depend on, on the faith of the people in them, which is not always there. Uh, so to me, that, that is a complete shift into a much more Jewish way of thinking. And, and also, it, it, more than anything else, maybe, more maybe even than things like, like Philip Roth and you know, popular, Phil Bell, popular mid-century American Jewish literature really helped kind of shift uh, the American imagination towards a much more Jewish way of looking at the world. 
Well, I'm going to let the rest of the team, I know they all have questions too, um, even though I have a million other ones, I'm going to let them ask them now. Um, one thing that I thought was really interesting that you discussed and that you just brought up now again too, um, was how distinctly American a lot of the cultural um, influences that played in were that, that it was American immigrants, that it was this Protestant work ethic. How did um, comics in different countries develop differently? Like I'm thinking of Tintin or something like that. And was there any dialogue between the writers and illustrators of those comics and American comics? That is an amazing question. Uh, I, I am a very big fan of a bunch of these traditions, uh, particularly the, the Asian traditions, which developed in their own, you know, completely different silo. Um, and so I think obviously they're all rooted in some kind of historical and cultural specificity of that country. But the part of your question, which, which fascinates me the most, uh, and I think it's, it's actually very instructive, uh, is the question about was there any influence? To the best of my knowledge, the answer is no. First of all, because there's, until very recently, no real way of getting it, right? I mean, these cats working in the 50s and the 60s, 70s, even in the 80s, like, you couldn't get stuff. This is, this is part of my gripe, my, I should say, middle-aged man gripe against kids today. Like, getting stuff is so easy. For me, like, I went to that comic store in New York. I came back. Those 30 comic books that I, you know, conned my parents into buying, that's all I had for like the next four years, right? So I studied them really thematically, uh, and, and there was just no other access. So these guys didn't have any access. The more interesting thing is they didn't, in many cases, they didn't even care. Stan Lee, for example, hated comics. When he grew up, there was already really popular comics, comic strips, uh, you know, Dick Tracy and things like that uh, in newspapers. And it struck him as kind of dumb uh, because the, the level of the writing, he always thought he would write the great American novel and he read, you know, plays and, and liked, you know, big dramatic literature and liked Mark Twain and things of that nature. Uh, and comic books struck him as kind of silly. In fact, before he became Stan Lee, he kind of wanted to quit the industry because the industry struck him as sort of idiotic. And in fact, it was his wife's wisdom of saying, look, before you quit, how about you just do one book the way you want to do it? And the rest is history. But no, there's, there's a weird disjointed uh, nature, I think, at least to the first couple of decades of American comics. It seems to really kind of be created out of the psyches and neuroses of, of its creators. Now, of course, it's much more kind of uh, intertextual, referential, global, which has made for some incredible, incredible, incredible work. But I kind of like the, the purity of the, of the original ignorance, if you will. Well, I have a question from somebody in the audience from Miriam Schenker. What about Wonder Woman saving the world from the Germans as played by Gail, uh, Gail Godot, Godot and the image of post-Holocaust world that that conjures? So that's an amazing question. Uh, and and uh, one of the parts that I love most uh, in, in, in writing this biography. So uh, Gal Gadot is, of course, the greatest uh, real life hero, as far as many of us are concerned, <laughs> not just as Wonder Woman, but in pretty much every other capacity. Uh, but the, the fascinating thing to remember is uh, Stan Lee joins Marvel Comics <clears throat> very uh, shortly before World War II begins. Uh, and when he joins, there are uh, two people uh, there who are his superiors, one of them being the great Jack Kirby, who I can't say enough about, I think is, is the other character in this book. And, probably one of the greatest American artists of the 20th century. Uh, and they are creating a new comic book character called Captain America for the sole purpose of having him fight Hitler. Because all around them, uh, they are very cognizant of the fact that nobody cares about the fate of Jews in Europe. Uh, the, the national uh, mood is kind of wishy-washy on whether or not we should go to war. The president seems to be kind of weighing his options. Uh, popular culture is not really interested in this, in this question. And so they do the one thing that they can do, which is, you know, make this scrawny little Brooklyn Jew guy be insert, uh, injected with some serum and develop into this mighty superhero who famously on the very first cover uh, socks Hitler in the jaw. Uh, and not only did they do that, but they, they sort of, uh, from the very first issue, encourage kids to send in money 
and join the, the sort of like the captain's club, uh, basically in, as a sort of a ploy to raise public awareness uh, to what was going on with, with, with Jews in the, the beginning, at that point, the beginning of, of, of the Holocaust. Uh, and it, it's kind of amazing that, that Marvel sort of grew, I think, in tandem uh, with this atmosphere. And I think this, this recognition or, or this, this particles in its DNA stayed very much part of Stanley's psyche because when he became boss, uh, it was very important to him to continuously get back to, uh, to questions of injustice. Uh, he was one of the first to deal with the Vietnam War, he's one of the first to deal with race riots, uh, one of the first to deal with issues like drug abuse and alcoholism. Uh, he was a very socially minded, uh, mindful editor and writer, I think in large part because his first exposure was to the power of comic books to really change public perception and policy. Um, have you thought about what kind of superhero and power Stanley would have uh, created out of the COVID-19 pandemic? Oh, my. <laughs> um, I, I think part of it would, would really uh, amuse him uh, because, again, to me, Stanley is never better than when he is uh, depicting his characters in very close proximity to one another. Uh, this is one reason why I love the Fantastic Four so much. Half of the comic book, to those who haven't read it, is them fighting, you know, aliens and bad guys. Half of the comic book is them stuck at home, uh, quarantined, if you will, at the Baxter building in their super fancy, you know, uh, apartment uh, complex uh, and fighting nonstop, like literally doing things like turning off the hot water in the middle of, you know, one person showering or like stealing food from the, from the pantry. I think this would have amused him to no end. Um, and I also think he would have gotten a lot of joy out of, out of this feeling, which uh, terrifies us, but works really well as fiction, of, of a complete loss of, um, of trust, if you will, in, in, in government and authority, a complete kind of disintegration of, of, of the body politic that we're living through. I mean, those were his years. He, he basically... You know, his best work was done when, when trust in the American government was at another, uh, you know, uh, nadir, uh, when, when people were asking themselves very big questions about the fundamental nature of this country and its politics. I think it would have felt very familiar to him. So I'm loving the book. I'm not quite finished. Um, but one, <laughs> and I, I, I use a dictionary or, you know, Google because periodically you have these amazing words just peppered through it. And I go, oh my God, what is that? I have to look it up. But um, I love jumping to the acknowledgements whenever I read a book. And you mentioned just now that um, Jewish Lives Yale had called you. Would you be interested? You said absolutely yes. You referenced David Miklas, and I'm a big fan of David Miklas, um, part-time Houstonian. And I'm wondering, you said that he encouraged you. So was there some hesitation? I know he's got a book coming out this year on Kubrick. I'd love to know what the conversation was that I guess sent you over the edge. So David is, is my, my colleague uh, at Tablet and one of the most brilliant and insightful writers uh, out there and, and someone I'm a big fan of and proud to be a colleague of. And so he got, uh, he got the contract to write the, the Kubrick book and told me about it. I said, it sounds absolutely fascinating. And I don't know whether by talking to, uh, to Eileen Smith at, at the Yale Lives, uh, the Yale University Press, uh, he's the one who kind of made the shidduch, if you will, who sort of introduced me uh, to them and, and then also kind of held my hand as I, as I basically began working on a proposal because I said right from the beginning, if they want a straightforward story of like, here's the tale of this guy's life, like, that's not the kind of book that I, that I want to write and it's not the kind of book that I would do best. What I want to do is, is get weird. What I want to do is really look at the, at the spiritual intellectual, religious, historical uh, background and influences of Stanley. And that excited him so much, and I'm, I'm grateful it has excited them so much, and here we are. Well, I would love for you, as we're winding down, to read a, a small selection from your book um, so people can hear what they're going to go purchase next when they get off of it. <laughs> With pleasure. So, you know, um, it's always a good idea, I'm told, to, to read the section 
from your book, when the, when the hero dies, that always puts people in, in a good kind of mood. Uh, and so I'm going to read from the very end of the book because I think it actually, while it shows Lee uh, in his you know, dwindling powers, uh, it also captures, I think, his essence in a nice way. This is uh, happening after Marvel Comics are dominant in the box office and culturally, and Stan Lee is a nonagenarian trying to figure out his new role in life. Contemplating his own role within the new age of Marvel, Lee had one final insight. Now an old man, he realized that the universe he had created was mature enough to stand on its own. It no longer needed Stan the man to shape it or sell it. It no longer needed to be defended against the snobs who considered it lowbrow. It was making enough money to dwarf them all. Marvel was no longer the counterculture. It was now the culture itself. Armed with that insight, Lee began his long walk into the sunset. He was there on screen in most Marvel movies, but only for a brief moment and usually as a minor and confused character like an old man trying to tow away Thor's immovable hammer in his pickup truck or a guy at a red carpet event, Tony Stark mistakes for Hugh Hefner. Did we freeze? And said, even in that, yeah. Okay, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, uh, did I black out? Sorry. Uh, that reassured fans that even though they were watching some big budget commercial movie produced by a crew of hundreds and costing tens of millions of dollars to make, their old friendly neighborhood comic book writer, Stan Lee, was still milling about, inviting them to stop by, say hello, ask a question or two. And so then uh, Stan passes away at the age of uh, 95 uh, in November of 2018. And uh, this is how I end the book. How then should we remember him? One moment in particular comes to mind. It's one of his beloved cameos, predating the official launch of the Marvel Cinematic Universe and coming in the middle of 2007's Spider-Man 3. Peter Parker, played by Tobey Maguire, is walking through Times Square when a headline flashing on a ticker overhead catches his eye. Spider-Man to receive key to the city, it reads, and Parker, amused, stops to look at it. Stan Lee walks into the frame, stands alongside Parker, and takes a moment to read the news as well. You know, he says before putting his hand on Parker's shoulder and disappearing into the crowd, I guess one person can make a difference. Enough said. Wow. Wow. Thank you so much. I was going to ask you one more question, but we're actually out of time. The question I was going to ask you is who's your favorite character and why, but just give us a one second. Who's your Let's favorite character? Very <laughs> easily. The Silver Surfer, because he's the most psychologically, spiritually complex character in all of comic book history and some of literature too. Well, Liel, thank you so much. It was my pleasure being able to, to talk to you about this and have everybody join us. We want to thank everybody who joined us today. Please, please consider buying Liel's fantastic book. You can check it out. Um, we have a link that's on, and we'll have a link online also. And next week's conversation is with Gail Carson Levine, and we're very, very excited to have her. Thank Liel. Thank you so guys, very much. Guys, thank you so much. Thank you, Leo. Bye, guys. Thanks, Leo. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Give our attendees a second to grab the links in the chat. <laughs>